Hello, I'm Pastor Rhonda from Elam Church Global and today I'm bringing the Discipleship Course Part 6 and we are continuing with the Christian walk. Let's begin with prayer. So Father God, Lord, we just ask that right now you still our hearts and our minds that we might hear your voice. And I'm asking, Lord, today that you bring conviction of sin where there needs to be conviction and you bring your grace. And, Father God, Lord, that you pour your love into our hearts through Holy Spirit. Lead us, teach us, guide us, equip and anoint us today, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. There's a verse in the Bible that says, If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed, behold, the new has come. Now, are you in Christ Jesus? Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Saviour? Does Holy Spirit live in your heart? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? that the debt has been paid? Well, if, if that is the case, you are in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ Jesus, then you are a new creation, which means the old person that you used to be is actually dead. That person died at the cross with Jesus. And with that person, all the sin, the shame, the guilt, the rejection, the pain, and even what's come against you as that old person has actually died. The old is past, the new has come. You are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. And every day God's mercy and love is new and fresh. Every morning as you wake up, his mercy is new for you. Every morning you can start out a fresh and new a new creation in Christ Jesus. That is such a wonderful truth. I pray that you will get the revelation of that and walk into the new life that Holy Spirit is doing in you. And I pray that you are becoming aware of Holy Spirit as he's transforming you from within. And I pray that you will see that he is making you holy just as he is holy to be more like Jesus. It truly is a wonderful walk, the Christian walk. But today we're going to be talking about our words, our words. Our words are powerful. Just as God, when he created the heavens and the earth, he spoke everything into existence. No, he did not have bits of tree and bits of flower and bits of skin when he created the world. He spoke and the world was created. Now we have been created in the image of God and we have authority from Jesus. And so we too can speak words of life, words of death, into situations and see situations change. And the Bible tells us in Proverbs, and I'm reading Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And if we speak words of death, we will reap the fruit of those words. And if we speak words of life, we'll reap the fruit of those words. So what are death words? Well, death words are d words of criticism or judging, cruel, unkind words, negative words, even words that are faithless. These are death words. And I'm sure you're all aware that as parents, 
we can actually speak life words or death words over our children that can change their whole destiny. And you're probably all aware that there are instances where children have heard words like you're good for nothing or you're useless or you're hopeless, you'll never amount to anything. These are death words. And Proverbs chapter 15 actually says that a wholesome tongue is a tree of life but perverseness in the tongue breaks the spirit. So as we receive death words ourselves, it can break our spirit. If we speak death words over someone else, we can be breaking that person's spirit. Our words are powerful. We need to understand the power of our words. And James chapter 3, James is in the New Testament, wonderful little book full of practical advice. James chapter 3 has a lot to say about our words, the tongue and the power of our tongue. And he says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. And it goes on to say, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So without Holy Spirit living in our lives, our tongues are evil. They spew out poison. And no man can tame the tongue. We on our own cannot control the words that are coming out of our mouths. But with Holy Spirit, we can control our tongues. So how do we do this? Well, we have to choose to no longer speak lies, filthy words, curses, blasphemy, words that are unholy and impure. We have to choose not to speak those words and we have to ask Holy Spirit to help us and he will because he's Holy Spirit. He wants us to be holy. And there's a verse in Ephesians chapter 4 and I use it as a prayer and I pray, Lord, let no corrupt word come out of my mouth but only what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. That's a good prayer to pray. Another prayer is from Psalm 141. Lord, set a guard over my lips that I might not sin against you. And we need to speak words of life. So what are words of life? Well, God's word is full of life and light. And as we speak God's word, then we are speaking life and light into situations. So, for instance, that person who has had death words over them so that they now have low self-worth or low self-esteem speaks out God's word from Psalm 139 and says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I have been created in the image of God and blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's who I am. And this is words of life and light. This is the truth. When we need healing, we speak words of healing and we declare that the Lord God has healed all my diseases. He is my healer. And as we speak those words of healing, Proverbs again tells us in chapter 16 that pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. And in Psalm 103 verse 20 the word says that as we speak out God's word, angels hearken to the voice of the Lord and they begin 
to minister that word. In other words, as we speak out God's word of life, his promises, his truths, as we speak them out over ourselves, over the situation, over other people, angels hear that word, they hear God's word, and they begin to do that word, to fulfil it for us. So it's really important that we speak words of life. And the word also tells us that out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. And this is where Holy Spirit comes in again. Because if we have bitterness or anger or hatred in our heart, you know what? It's going to come out of our mouth. Out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. And so as we confess our sin and are forgiven of our sin and as we yield more and more to Holy Spirit, he will bring about that change in our hearts where the fruit of the Spirit will start to, to develop in us. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And so as we yield to Holy Spirit, out of our mouths are going to come what's happening in our hearts and we're going to be speaking words of life and light, powerful words to change situations. And you know... Everything I'm saying today needs to be acted upon. We have to be not just hearers of God's word, but doers. And James has something to say about that as well. I'm reading to you James chapter 1. And it says, therefore lay aside. Now that means we have to do it. Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, God's word, which is able to save your souls, your mind, your will and your emotions. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer, of the word and not a doer he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror for he observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word this one will be blessed in what he does. I encourage you, don't just hear this word today. Apply it to your lives. Be doers of the word and then you will see your life being transformed to become more like Jesus. Now Jesus taught the people and in the Bible, there's a, a collection of his teachings. They were done when he went up to a mountain in the Galilee area of Israel. And they're called the Sermon on the Mount. You'll find them in Matthew chapters 5, 6 and, and 7. I encourage you to read them. And as you read them, again, ask Holy Spirit to speak to you and challenge you about any areas of your life that need to be changed. And part of that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke these words. And he said, the lamp of the body is the eye. So we've been talking about our words. Now we're talking about our eyes and what we are looking at. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, your eye is good, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now what was Jesus saying here? Well, he was saying that what you look at, what you read, what you watch is going to have an effect on whether your body, your life is full of light or darkness. So if you are looking at things that are not of God, if your the word actually says if your eye is bad or evil, if you are looking at things that are evil, then your whole body is going to be full of darkness. And darkness means sin and death. It's the complete opposite to Holy Spirit, who is life and light. And so we need to think about what we are looking at. And again, we need to make the choice. The choice is always ours. God will not force us. He does not do that. But if we want to have lives full of light and life and the love of Holy Spirit then we need to be careful what we're looking at we need to actually choose to no longer look at pornography to no longer look at movies that may have witchcraft or the occult in them or even illicit sex in them we need to be careful that we're not reading books that are full of blasphemy or ungodly talk or ungodly themes so we need to to guard our eyes because if we have diseased eyes we're going to have darkness inside us and if we continue to look at things that are not of God what we are actually doing is opening a door to the enemy now yes we have an enemy and his plan is to steal, kill and destroy us. And if we continue to do things that are ungodly, then we are actually opening a door to allow him to come in against us. And he will come against us with darkness. But God's word says, be holy even as I am holy and Holy Spirit lives in us and remember he's our teacher he's our counselor he's our helper he is guiding us through this Christian walk counseling us every step of the way he will convict us of the sin if we fall into sin and with that sin he gives us the way out by confessing that sin and being forgiven and so as we yield to Holy Spirit and choose to be holy, then Holy Spirit will actually take the desire away for those evil things because he is holy and he wants us to be holy. And what does it mean to be holy? Well, to be holy means to be set apart from the world and set apart to God. And that's who we are now as disciples of Jesus we're no longer conforming to the world and the world's ways we are being transformed by the power of Holy Spirit and the more that we yield to Holy Spirit when the enemy does come against us we can resist him and see him flee okay the crux of the Christian gospel, the good news of Jesus, the very crux of that is God's love, mercy and forgiveness of our sins. And just as God has forgiven us every sin and not only forgiven but removed that sin, that sin is gone, the penalty has been paid, the debt has been paid, we are no longer in debt to God for our sin. We are free. Just as God has done that, he commands us to forgive those who sin against us, who hurt us, who even abuse us.
He commands us to forgive. And in Matthew chapter 6, we read the Lord's Prayer. And part of the Lord's Prayer is this. And Jesus spoke it out. He says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And then he goes on to say, for if you forgive men their sins, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, neither will your father forgive your sins. Now, this is a very serious thing and we need to understand what Jesus is saying. He is saying, Father, forgive us our sins when we pray that prayer for ourselves as we forgive those who sin against us. So if we don't forgive people when they've hurt us, Father God, actually what we're doing is we're disqualifying ourselves from receiving Father God's forgiveness. And that's a serious thing. Because if our sin is not forgiven, then we are not right with God. God wants us, he commands us to forgive others. And Jesus told a story in Matthew chapter 18 to, dis to de describe this situation where there was a man who could not forgive someone who had sinned against him. And the, the, the dire consequences of that for that man. I'm going to share it to you. I'll, I'll paraphrase it from Matthew chapter 18. But just before we get to that, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I keep forgiving him? Do I do it seven times? And Jesus said, no. No, I don't say to you seven times. I say to you 70 times seven. 70 times seven. What is Jesus saying here? Well, he's saying you must forgive and forgive and forgive and keep forgiving. And no, you don't count how many times you forgive. You just do it and it becomes a way of life that you forgive this one who's hurt you and this one who's spoken against you and this one who's done something else towards you, you forgive and you forgive and you forgive. Why? Because our Heavenly Father has forgiven us our sin. And so Jesus went on to tell this story. He said there was a king, and I'm just paraphrasing it here, there was a king who came to settle his accounts and a servant was brought to him who owed him a lot, a big, big sum of money. And the, the servant was not able to pay the king what he owed. And so the king said, well, you must be sold with all your family, all your goods, so that you can pay back your debt. And the servant fell down before the king and asked him to have patience and promised that he would pay it all. Then the king looked at the servant and the word says here that he was moved with compassion and he released that servant and forgave him the whole debt. Now, this is a picture of Father God. This is what Father God has done for us. We have sinned against God because God is a holy God. And when we sin, we sin against God. And our sin is huge. It is absolutely huge. And when we come before God and ask for forgiveness, he looks at us with compassion and love and he says, yes, your sin is forgiven. I actually put your sin on my son Jesus and Jesus paid the punishment and the penalty for your sin. It's been paid for. You are released from your debt. That's what Father God says to us. Now, this man who had been forgiven went out and found a fellow servant who owed him a small amount of money 
And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And the fellow servant fell down and begged, saying, Have patience with me, and yes, I will repay. But the man who had been forgiven would not. And instead he went and had the fellow servant thrown into prison because he couldn't pay his small debt. Now when the king heard that, he called the servant who had been forgiven to him and he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And the king was angry and delivered the man who could not forgive to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And Jesus finished this account by saying, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his sins. And so we need to understand what came to this man who could not forgive. He was delivered to the torturers. Now, who are the torturers? Well, it's the enemy, the enemy who comes against us. And as well as that, he was delivered to the torturers and his debt of sin was no longer released. It was against him. And Jesus said, so my heavenly father will do to you if you can't forgive those who have hurt you. And so we need to understand that to harbour unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness in our hearts, even hatred in our hearts towards anyone else is like flinging the door open to the torturer, the enemy, and he will come in and he will take his toll on our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health, and certainly spiritually. So we need to forgive. So how do we forgive those who have hurt us, who have come against us, who have even abused us? How do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to choose to forgive. And you know what? In our own strength, we can't do it only by the power of Holy Spirit who lives in us can we forgive someone. But first of all, we have to choose to forgive and we have to ask God to help us, to give us his grace, his love to forgive. And if we realise that we've already got unforgiveness in our heart against a person, then we must ask God to forgive us because we're sinning against God and to wash us again in the blood of Jesus, his very life to come over us, to forgive us for harbouring that unforgiveness and be free of that. And you know, sometimes we don't even know we've got unforgiveness in our hearts. We don't even know the state of our hearts. Only God does. And so sometimes we need to say to God, Lord, show me if there's any unforgiveness resentment or bitterness in my heart towards anyone you know what holy spirit will show you he will show you and when he shows you you ask forgiveness and you ask for the grace to forgive that person so practically the way to forgive someone is to pray for them jesus said pray for your enemies pray blessings over them not curses so we bless them. We ask God to bless them, bless their homes, bless their families, bless their life, bless their health, bless their finances. And we pray blessing over them every day. We pray regularly. It's like, it's like a, a job to do every day to lift up these ones who have hurt us and pray a blessing over them. We seek to do good to them and we love them. And yes, love will come because as we pray for them, what happens is Holy Spirit changes 
our hearts and he removes that resentment and unforgiveness and bitterness from our hearts. And so we come to that place where we know that we are free of that and we have forgiven that person and we are even able to love them. It sounds very difficult, I know. And yes, it takes time and yes, it takes discipline to do it. But remember, you can do it on, you cannot do it on your own, but Holy Spirit lives in you and Holy Spirit is the spirit of power and love. Now Jesus gave us a command in John chapter 13. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Do you hear what this Jesus is saying? He's saying, love one another as I have loved you. Well, how did Jesus love us? Well, he, he emptied himself. He laid his life down for us. He came to rescue us and deliver us from sin and death and hell. He died so that we could live. He took our punishment. He was wounded so that we could be healed. He was cursed so that we could be blessed. He served us. He has laid his whole life down for us. And this is the love that he's asking us to do for others. To love one another as I have loved you, says Jesus. And then he goes on to say, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So as we are a witness out in the world by sharing with our words what Jesus has done for us, but we also witness to Jesus to be one of his disciples by the love that we have for other people. This is the practical living witness that we are to be to love one another. So what is this love? What does this love really look like? Well, it's the agape love. Agape is the Greek word for love. It's the highest form of love. It's unconditional love. It's a love not by choice, but not by chance rather, but by choice. It's a love not of emotions, but an active love. And it's a love that seeks the highest good of the other person. And we read about this love in... 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and I'm actually going to read this from the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible is the, the Bible but with extra description and understanding added to it in, from the words. So I'm reading chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians and this is God's agape love. This is God's agape love and this is the love that God has poured into our hearts through Holy Spirit. So it, he's poured it into us so that we can love him and we can love others. This is the love. God's agape love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant or inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful 
or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. It is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails. Love never fades out or becomes obsolete or comes to an end. That's God's agape love. And as I said before, that love has been poured into your hearts through Holy Spirit who lives in you. And I just want to pray a prayer now. And I'm praying a prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. I want to pray for you. So Father God, I come before you and I'm asking God that you would grant those who are listening according to the riches of your glory to be strengthened with might through your spirit in their inner man. I'm asking God that you, Jesus, will dwell in their hearts through faith and that they will be rooted and grounded in love, your agape love, and that they will be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know that is to experience the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that they may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. Just as we finish up, I want to really encourage you to be planted in a church. Be planted in a church. Now you need to pray and ask God to show you the church that he wants you to be planted in. And it needs to be a Bible teaching church and a church that is moving in the power of Holy Spirit. And the church is described as the body of Christ, the body of Christ here on earth. And just like a physical body has a head, the body of Christ has a head who is Jesus. And just like a physical body has eyes and a nose and a mouth and fingers and hands and feet, all with different functions and roles to play to bring about a healthy body. So the body of Christ is made up of believers, all with different functions and roles and talents to play to bring about a strong, healthy moving church. Now each believer in the body of Christ is united to each other through Holy Spirit who lives in each of us and through our love for Jesus and our obedience to Father God. So we are united but we are different in our different roles. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I encourage you to read this chapter talks about the body of Christ, like a, like a human body being put together, each with a different role. And you might be saying, well, I don't know what my role is or my ministry within the church. I don't know what it is. Well, I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You'll read about the spiritual gifts that Holy Spirit gives to every believer and you can ask Holy Spirit to show you what it is that he is wanting to release into your life in a spiritual gift. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about ministry gifts that each one of us can walk into empowered by Holy Spirit to be and to build the church of God. And so I encourage you to, to seek out your spiritual giftings and when you know your spiritual giftings, to use them. 
because this is how God has arranged the body of Christ, that each one of us will be using our talents, our gifts, our spiritual ministries to build the body of Christ, to encourage each other, but also to build God's kingdom and to fulfil the Great Commission. And I'll just remind you again, the Great Commission is to go into the world and preach the gospel, to heal the sick, deliver from demons, to share Jesus with others. That's the Great Commission and we can only fulfil that as we walk in the spiritual giftings that God has given us. We have been called to be Jesus' disciples and that role involves us not only to just be in the kingdom of heaven but also to build the kingdom of heaven. I encourage you be planted in a church. You cannot do the Christian walk without the church body, the body of Christ, being in the body of Christ. Let me just pray as we finish up. Oh, Father God, Lord, speak to us, I pray, and show us, Lord, areas in our lives, things that need to change, Lord God, that we can be holy people. Lord, show us the words that we are speaking Show us what we are looking at, Lord God, that is not pleasing to you. And with that conviction, Lord, give us your grace, your power to lay these things down and yield to you so that we can be transformed and be people who look more like Jesus. Father God, show us if there's any unforgiveness in our hearts towards anyone. And again, Lord, help us to forgive. Help us to understand, Father God, that you command us to forgive others. And Lord, help us to love with your agape love. Continue to pour that love into our hearts. Lead us by your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Show us the way that you would have us live. Help us to hear your voice and give us your grace to be obedient to what you are saying for each one of us and cause us, Lord, to live for your glory. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We've talked about a lot of different issues, personal issues today. And so I encourage you to make contact with me if you would like to talk more or have prayer about any of these issues that have been raised today. You can do that through the Discipleship Support Group, which is on Facebook, and the details will come up on the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to stand with you and support you and pray for you as you continue in your Christian walk. And can I encourage you to read the book of James. It's a wonderful book. It's only five chapters. Read the book of James. I encourage you to read Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7, Jesus' teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, and also read 1 Corinthians 12 to have an understanding of spiritual gifts that Holy Spirit wants to give you. Can I encourage you to start reading Proverbs? Proverbs is in the Old Testament. It's a book of wisdom practical wisdom applying God's word to our lives there's 31 chapters in Proverbs I suggest you read one a day and continue to read through the Psalms read the word the word is life and light to you pray and seek God early in the morning spend your time with him worshiping and praising make sure you give thanks every day for the blessings and the, the wonderful things that God has done for you. And keep going out and telling others about Jesus. Tell others what Jesus has done for you. Encourage them 
to seek out Jesus for themselves and pray that they will receive him as Lord and Saviour also. And may God bless you and may God keep you and may God guide you through these days. Goodbye for now.